I think it's interesting to talk about some of these quote unquote older treatments, IL-2, people don't talk about really anymore. Um, and some of the other things I'll talk about this afternoon are kind of similar. Some things get labeled as being not productive and they just get thrown on the shelf. But the, you know, that's kind of interesting when you develop a new drug, we don't really have a clue as to how to use it. And we usually give a whole bunch of it and see if somebody will survive and if they do, whether they get any benefits. So some of these treatments may actually be used a little differently actually for much better benefit. So I think it's worth going back over some of this information. I think Dr. Oleski did a great job of bringing that in. Now we're going to kind of go into, some, into a realm that uh, I think not most of us know about, but uh, Dr. Jack Fon Fontaine uh, is actually another thoracic surgeon, so I'm glad to have another thoracic surgeon in the room. Um, and uh, he trained uh, uh, and he got a medical degree from McGill University in, in Montreal and a general surgery residency in Boston University. They went, unfortunately, to the Brigham. That's our arch enemy on the other side of the world. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, and he subsequently has been at uh, University of Montreal, Brown, and is now at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. And we're hoping that he got through the hurricanes okay. Uh, enough to get here. He's a section head for mesothelial research and treatment. Um, and he's going to, let me see the official name. He's going to talk to us about transarterial chemoperfusion, which is something that I think we all can learn a lot about. Thank you. Good morning. I appreciate the invitation, and it's an honor to be here at this symposium. I think I have to start off by telling a little story because uh, it kind of puts it in perspective uh, to be here at the symposium in 2017. About 20 years ago, I started off as an intern. And, uh, and I was in Montreal, and I turned, I saw a patient in clinic, in thoracic clinic, and a patient had mesothelioma. I didn't know the nodal status, I didn't know the type of mesothelioma, just plural mesothelioma. And I turned to my, uh, to my professor, at the time it was Dr. Duranceau, and I said, oh, this patient has mesothelioma, what are we gonna do? And he said, son, the only thing you can do for mesothelioma is give him a fishing rod and tell him to go fishing, because that's the only thing, that's the best thing for this guy. Okay, so that was uh, 1995. Ten years later, uh, 2005, I was uh, chief resident at the Brigham uh, in Boston with Dr. Sugarbaker. And I was in clinic also, and I saw patients with mesothelioma. Didn't really matter, epithelial, sarcomatoid, nodal status. Walked in through the door. It's not a fishing rod. It's an extra pleuronymonectomy with heated chemo. That's what you get. And then ten years later, here we are in 2017, and we have a whole symposium going through all the different therapeutic options. And I think this is really amazing, the fact that we don't have just a hammer for every nail, but we have so many different tools to treat this disease. And it's important also to think that not every single patient needs a certain type of therapy, but rather it's a multimodality approach based on histology, based on nodal status, based also very much so, I think, in my experience, on their performance status. So I'm here to discuss one specific thing, really. Um, well, here we're discussing just pleural mesothelioma. Although in a minority of patients it occurs in the abdomen or in the pericardium, we're here concentrating just on pleural mesothelioma. Now, a lot of times I get at our cancer center, or referral center, I get patients with pleural plaques and they've worked for a few years in a shipyard or with breaks and they come with these pleural plaques and a cytology from an effusion showed atypical cells, possible mesothelioma, and the patients have sometimes gotten chemotherapy for this. And it's very, very important to establish a right diagnosis and not be treating these pleural plaques with an associated cytology that showed atypia as mesothelioma. Although uh, asbestos use is down or uh, not used in multiple countries because of the latency, this is a problem that we're going to keep seeing. So I think it's important to go ahead with all the research that we're doing because this is not a disease that's uh, on the tailpipe of it, but we're going to be seeing more and more of it. And although it is very uh, uncommon in the United States, it's still fairly common, and it's much more common in other countries. So it's important to have these international symposiums, such as the one that Dr. Cameron just organized. The problem with mesothelioma and why, as you heard, the prognosis is so poor is for two reasons. I think one is tumor biology. It is an aggressive disease. 
But the second is the fact that it's such a difficult diagnosis to make because so many other symptoms can be mimicked by other things. A pleural effusion most of the time is not caused by mesothelioma. Even in a patient that had a remote exposure to asbestos, it's caused by other things. The other thing is that it's very hard to, uh, it's very hard to detect because we don't have any screening that work. Although chest x-rays are not sensitive and CT scans, they may detect asbestos-related plaques or disease. They have a very low yield for mesothelioma and they have no survival advantage, unlike non-small cell lung cancer, and it's therefore not recommended. So right now, although there is some hope with serum biomarkers to be used as a screening in high-risk patients, in 2017, there is still no screening for mesothelioma. And it's for this reason, because of the fact that other diseases that are much more common mimic mesothelioma presentation, because we don't have screening, and because it's very hard to distinguish it from the much, much more common non-small cell lung cancer, we usually diagnose these patients much later. And on average, it takes about six to nine months to diagnose the mesothelioma from the time of their initial presentation to a physician. The second thing is that it's important to know exactly what type of mesothelioma. In 1995 and 2005, it didn't matter as much when I was seeing those patients, but I think it's of vital importance. And now we're seeing, seeing this, this variance among the epithelial, the papillary variants, especially in younger patients. And those patients do remarkably differently and remarkably well compared to other histological types. In stage one mesothelioma, we have many more options, especially in stage one mesothelioma where the patients have an excellent performance status. The problem is that most of the patients that I see are not stage one. They're stage two or stage three. They have nodal involvement or they've already had previous chemotherapy and they've progressed through it or they have a poor performance status. They're 78 years old. They have multiple medical comorbidities and we finally made a diagnosis of mesothelioma after they've lingered with a pleural effusion for several months or years. So we have different options and we have to treat every different patient differently. So uh, cater to each patient differently. Now supportive care is not a wrong option in some patients. Talc pleuridesis, as you know, it's important to look not only at the quantity of life that we can offer the patients, but also in mesothelioma, the quality of life is so important. Palliation of symptoms, in my opinion, is almost as important as quantity of life and, and improving overall survival. So talc pleurodesis or some type of pleurodesis does have a role, especially if it can improve palliation, because if you improve their symptoms and palliate them, then sometimes they can withstand having uh, chemotherapy. Photodynamic therapy, you've already heard about. Radiation is used for local palliation, or it can be an adjunct, as you've heard about. But the problem is that if the lung is left behind after a pleurectomy, it's very hard, although feasible, in certain, as the memorial data shows, it's very high risk to give uh, crippling pneumonitis or life-threatening pneumonitis for the remaining lung. Chemotherapy, we've heard about, has some survival advantage and certainly used as an adjunct. And surgery, although has been discredited in more recent years, is very, very useful in a highly selected group of patients. So as you've heard, this study was quoted multiple times. This was the study in 2003 that showed that uh, doublet therapy with cisplatin-based doublet therapy did show survival advantage in these patients. But you can see here that still the median overall survival was about 12 months with a response rate of 41%. So just keep that in the back of your mind when we talk about are there any other, other options when you fail this chemotherapy. So um, chemotherapy is usually with pemetrexate, but a second agent can be added to the cisplatin with response rate, as I was saying, up to 40% and median survival that can go up to 16 months. Now let's say chemotherapy is not, uh, is not the only option. Now some patients do come with early stage disease. Some patients do have a good enough performance status. And as Dr. Cameron very elegantly demonstrated, surgery does have a role. Now whether you're doing a pleurectomy or an extra pleuronymectomy, it's up to the surgeon choice in a way, but the goal is to do a complete macroscopic resection, an R1 resection, remove everything that you can see with the naked eye. 
Now, if you feel that you can get this with a pleurectomy, decortication or a radical pleurectomy, then you should do so. Why waste the patient's lung? However, if you feel that it goes deep in the fissure or you feel that it's in the hilum or you don't feel that you have enough experience with pleurectomy and you feel that the patient can get can withstand a, an extra pneumonectomy, maybe that's the better choice. So I think it's a complete macroscopic resection is the, is the goal, and if you can do it while sparing the lung, that should be the ultimate goal as well. Now, a pleurectomy is certainly less invasive, it's less morbid, allows you to uh, have the same complete resection in certain instances. The downside is that it's very hard to give radiation, not impossible, but very hard to give hemithoracic radiation afterwards. So as you've heard, the MARS trial is really the, uh, the only trial comparing surgery to no surgery uh, in the, with the addition of chemotherapy in both arms and radiation after surgery. With the problem with this trial, although it showed that there was no advantage to doing surgery, there's uh, the fact that only a very small percentage of patients ended up going through the surgery. So only 16 patients ended up with an extra, extra pleural pneumonectomy. So I think it's completely unfair to write off surgery on a trial where there's actually only 16 patients that underwent surgery. And of those 16 patients, three of them died. So it's a mortality of 19%. So I think, although it is an interesting trial, and it is an important trial, I think there, it doesn't discredit completely surgery for mesothelioma. But it does tell us that we must be highly selective. So although I came out in 2005, I came out of the Brigham, and the first thing I did was I wanted to operate every single mesothelioma patient that I saw. I think over the years, <clears throat> I've learned and I've become much more selective. I operate on patients that have excellent performance status, especially if I'm thinking of doing an extra pneumonectomy, because patients' quality of life afterwards, no matter where it's done or who you do it on, is, does decrease. I think it's important to try to select the best patients. We all know that epithelial type, I'm not saying that you can't operate on biphasic patients or sarcomatoid, but if you want to really get good results, if you want to get the most and offer the most for the patient, if we're to be honest with them, I think that ep operating on epithelial type only provides you with the best results. It's important that the patients also have early stage disease. As you've seen on all the trials, as soon as they have N2 or mediastinal disease, nodal disease, their prognosis is much worse. So can we really offer major surgery, which has a morbidity and a mortality, to a patient that has N2 disease? Personally, we don't do it in Moffitt. And they have to have excellent cardiac and pulmonary function. And certainly you can do this. In the MARS trial, the mortality was 19%. Three out of the 16 patients in that arm died. Here are this Dr. Sugarbaker's data from the Brigham, where it's a mortality, an excellent mortality of 3.4, and that's been mimicked in other studies as well. But you can see the morbidity is 60%. More than half the patients get some type of short-term complication. And the other thing that you can see is that the median age was 58. I can certainly tell you that the median age of patients I see at Moffitt Cancer Center in Florida is not 58. It's over 68 or between about 70 years old. So we're talking about a different population as well. Now, if you looked at the overall survival in these patients, it was not stellar. However, if you started extrapolating and you see the patients that have N uh, that, that don't have mediastinal nodal disease, and where there was a complete resection, so-called negative margin, although theoretically I think it's impossible to get true, complete microscopic negative margins all over, because even a pathologist, no matter how long they spend, they won't be able to look at the whole specimen. But if you extrapolate and you find a good resection, and the patients had no nodal disease, and they had epitheliotype, they can have a median survival much better than just with chemotherapy only. Now, fine, that comes out of Dr. Uh, after, out of uh, the Brigham, but are there any other centers that showed that surgery does have a role? And yes, out of University of Toronto, Dr. Uh, Cameron mentioned Dr. DePero's um, work. Now, this was extra pluminectomy with radiation and chemotherapy, and uh, the overall survival for the patient, median overall survival for all patients on an intent to treat basis was only 14 months. So you can say, well, that's not that much. That's close to chemotherapy only. 
However, in the patients that were able to complete the protocol, which was only a small group, I have to say, only 30 patients completed a protocol with chemo, extra polymectomy, and radiation, and those patients who had negative lymph node disease, it was a small group, the median survival was 59 months, which is excellent. So if you compare the series from University of Toronto with a 53% five-year survival and Brigham with a 40% five-year survival, and these patients were able to complete all three arms, the chemo, the surgery, and the radiation, and they had epithelial and negative disease, those patients had 40 to 53% five-year survival, so excellent survival here. But this is an extremely selected group of patients. Now, when they, you look at this uh, study out of uh, um, uh, Brigham, NYU, and Memorial Sloan Kettering, where they also got chemo, extra polyneumonectomy, and radiation, and this time it was 40 patients who were able to complete all the, all the three arms of the study. And they showed that if you completed, you had a slightly less survival at a 29-month median survival if you're able to complete the whole study. Interestingly, nodal disease did not impact in this study. That's great. So in highly selected patients, surgery has a role. And certainly chemotherapy with cisplatin doublet has a role. But unfortunately, the majority of the patients I see in our practice at Moffitt do not fit that category. Either they've, they're not surgical candidates because they have non-epithelial disease, or they have nodal disease, or they have a poor performance status, or they simply don't want surgery after I explain to them what an extra pleuronymonectomy or radical pleurectomy is. So those patients are not surgical candidates. That, in fact, is the majority of the patients I see. Or how about the patients that have already been referred to us from an oncologist and they've progressed through first-line doublet therapy? What do you offer those patients? Well, we, I think in those patients, you can look at several different options. Immunotherapy is an option. Um, other types of uh, gene therapy is an option. One option that we did find, and we based on one study that we found, is to infuse chemotherapy. And our goal would be just like the same rationale for heated chemotherapy. This is more of a, the rationale is that you want local therapy. You want to be able to apply it. So you can either apply it from within, so you can open up the chest or put catheters in the chest and give intra or you, intracavitary chemotherapy or some type of therapy intracavitary, or you can reach it without being as invasive, still invasive, but less invasive, you can go through the arterial system and then target the vessels that are feeding that tumor and try to give your therapy selectively or more selectively to that area. So instead of giving it intracavitary, you're giving it intra-arterial. So we start off with something more simple, just with chemotherapy, and the rationale is to be able to increase the amount of uh, chemotherapy that you give, so higher doses, and to minimize overall systemic effects. We based our uh, protocol at Moffitt on a study that was published in 2013 out of Germany. This is a study, it was a second line trial, so all the patients had mesothelioma that had progressed through chemotherapy. There were 39 patients, recruited over three years. The mean age was 64. They had a tumor burden that was average, about 773 milliliters. And they all were considered to be in that category I talked about, either unresectable or not fit for surgery or refused surgery. And all of them had progressed through first-line chemotherapy. And what Dr. Vogel did in his group was he cannulated the femoral artery and he selectively found the thoracic aorta and try, if possible, to get the intercostal artery or the inter internal mammary artery or the long thoracic artery. And he infused cisplatin, mitomycin C, and gencitabine. And he did it every four weeks through this femoral artery cannulation until disease progression. What were the results? Well, on 39 patients that he treated, 14 patients, about 36%, had a partial response at first. Eventually, they all progressed, but they had a partial response. 19 patients, or half the patients, remained with stable disease, and uh, six patients progressed after just one, uh, one infusion. You can say, well, that's 
pretty invasive, you're doing ephemeral artery cannulation. The thing is, the majority of them, 72% of them were performed as outpatient and you had no procedure-related complication from it. So you can say, well, 36% of patients had a partial response. That is very similar to systemic chemotherapy, and it is. So selective arterial perfusion of chemotherapy has the same partial response rate as systemic therapy. But these are patients who had already progressed through standard chemotherapy. So it's a, it's a select group of patients who already failed systemic th chemotherapy. But more importantly is that what were, the, uh, what were some of the side effects? The side effects of thoracic pain, or rather some of the, the advantages of this therapy is that it palliated some of the things such as the, the side effects is that it palliated some of the uh, symptoms. So we're looking, as we talked about, not only at having a partial response or increasing median survival, but we're also looking to palliate patient symptoms. And if the patient already had a, uh, a tau pleurodesis or a pleurex catheter and they still have dyspnea, how can you palliate them? Well, this was a way of palliating them where 40% of patients had a significant um, decrease in their dyspnea and their cough, and 66% had a decrease in their chest pain. And this is a group of patients, as I was mentioning, that had failed standard chemotherapy. The median survival, the mean survival was 14.2 uh, months from the start of therapy and 21 months from the start of first diagnosis. So this is very similar to systemic therapy. So you can say, why, why would you ever do this since systemic therapy gives you the same thing. Well, these are patients that failed systemic therapy. So we decided to uh, open up a trial like this at Moffitt, but instead of using the same three chemotherapy agents as Dr. Vogel, we decided to change the, we kept the cisplatin because that, that is the gold standard that's been proven, <clears throat> but we changed the mitomitis, mitomitin C to a methotrexate since uh, it's an antifolate, much similar to Olympta, to pemetrexate, and we kept the gemcitabine. As you can see, it's a low dose of cisplatin because when we went through our, our IRB, we we're not allowed to give higher doses. So we have to be able to do 20 patients first, show safety, and uh, then we will have a dose escalation after 20 patients. And the goal is to be able to give higher doses than regular systemic therapy and have effectiveness with decreased side effects. So our primary objective was to calculate our response rate using rhesus criteria. Secondary objectives of our study is to show overall survival, progression-free survival, safety, as I talked about, and also, more importantly, I think, is quality of life. So these are some of the images. So I'm not, I'm, I'm a thoracic surgeon. I'm not the one who does the study. It's uh, one of our interventional radiologists in our group, uh, Dr. Kish. So he does uh, femoral, femoral artery cannulization, aortogram. Then in this study, he, uh, in this uh, particular patient, he found the internal mammary artery, as you can see here, com uh, confirms that it's uh, feeding that tumor and then selectively with the balloon cannulates the internal mammary artery or a few intercostal arteries and does the infusion of the chemotherapy. It took us a while to get through the IRB, but we finally did. <clears throat> we opened it in March 2016. As uh, we talked about, we wanted to do 20 patients first to do an interim analysis, show safety, and then do dose escalation. So far, we've recruited 11 patients. Six patients are currently on trial, so meaning that they have not had disease progression since they started. Five patients started on the trial but uh, completed or finished the trial, came off the trial because they didn't have disease progression. So far, we don't have enough data to be able to uh, publish anything, but we've had one complication uh, related to, we had one embolic event to uh, the foot and then the patient was started, uh, was given TPA. And uh, we're still waiting for the patient, for the study to close to be able to do any interim data analysis. <clears throat> These are some of the images, patients who had a, a response. You can see here this tumor on the left side before and after. And again here you can see one next to the aorta. 
Certainly, I'm not saying that this is the only modality for patients who have uh, progressed through systemic chemotherapy, because if they're not surgical candidate and they progress through chemotherapy, well, you can certainly do cryotherapy, as Dr. Cameron uh, mentioned. You can certainly do uh, radiation therapy, but this is just one of the multiple options, and I think the more options you have for a patient, the better it is. So we're very uh, proud to be able to participate in today's symposium, and I appreciate the invitation.